Priceless ancient treasures torn out of the ground. Precious art ripped from walls and sold to the highest bidder. Welcome to a multi-billion dollar black market nobody wants to talk about until now. The grandest of mankind's achievements reduced to obscene commodities. The spoils snatched up by wealthy collectors from shady middlemen, laundered through a network of international criminals. It's a global crime wave. Where the cash ends up in the pockets of the world's worst crooks, while nobody asks the big questions. How can it still be happening? This is a modern tragedy. History itself, dug up, destroyed, or sold off. There's an old saying in the Middle East, dig a hole anywhere and you'll either strike oil or find a precious artifact. Either way, you're rich. It's kept looters, dealers, and collectors on a steady income for thousands of years. In Iraq, Saddam Hussein wrote his own rules and the looting business was changed forever. And at the height of the longest conflict in modern warfare, the Iraq Museum, once the repository of human history, became a target. One of the world's greatest collections of ancient artifacts has gone. But had it gone forever, it all comes down to two men, two unlikely allies, armed only with a passion for justice. They took one item and not the one next to it. They were quite selective, and they chose the highest value items that were on the gallery floor. It was a place that contained the, the heritage of mankind. They were up against ruthless criminal organizations. Could these two men rescue the history of mankind? It's a story 6,000 years in the making. This story begins in Mesopotamia more than 6,000 years ago. A fertile land nestled between the mighty Tigris and Euphrates rivers. Also known as the cradle of civilization, its importance to human history is immeasurable. It becomes a glittering El Dorado for all those looking to cash in on its ancient history. You have the growth of the first cities in southern Mesopotamia. The earliest examples of civilization and urbanization. The place where Abraham was born in, or lived in Ur, Babylon, for instance, you have the exile of Jews. You have, of course, the creation uh, myth and all these stories uh, that are affiliated more or less with this ancient land of Mesopotamia. Very important and critical step in the development and evolution of, of, of human complex societies agriculture, domestication of plants and animals, but more critically, irrigation as well, that allowed for the intensification of food production. You have the earliest systems of writing, documentation, mainly for keeping records, being able to redistribute that wealth. The finest examples of art and craftsmanship surviving from ancient times have ended up the most sought after prizes of today. Many scholars look at the Walker vase as the foremost piece that marks the emergence of narrative art itself. Priceless works of art, it turns out, do have a price. The Walker vase, it dates back to the late, what they call the late fourth millennium, so um, 3000, 3200 BC. And it came from a, a temple in the site in southern Mesopotamia, the site of Ur, which is quite well known. The, uh, the carving is a narrative, it's, a, it, it, it's action, and it is one of the earliest that we know of. And as empires and cities rise, fall and crumble to dust, the treasures left behind lie forgotten beneath the sand. Did the people who lived in these first cities understand their legacy? And did they know what the future held for their sleeping relics? The Sumerians actually invented time. They, I think, I think they hoped this, um, that they would be people who would then be admired into the future. I mean, part of them wishing to create their own, uh, their own legacy. Obviously, the ancients would have known that looting would have 
been occurring even back then. Uh, and uh, just preventing the, the looting of these tombs would have been a kind of primary goal. Thousands of years have passed as the 20th century dawns and inquisitive travelers and fortune seekers arrive. Their eyes bright with the images of unimaginable treasure from biblical times. The looting has begun. The first Europeans to bury a spade in Iraq's ancient soil believe they are searchers on a just cause, but it's hardly a righteous crusade. They take the burgeoning racket to the next level. With better resources than the opportunists that came before them, the world's first genuine archaeologists were driven by a thirst for knowledge and research. But for some, it soon became all about the cachet and the cash. It was bad news for history. A man who found the area fascinating was respected British archaeologist Leonard Woolley. In 1922, Leonard and his crew descended on the ancient city of Ur, the legendary birthplace of Abraham. Uncovering and revealing a trove of ancient treasures to a breathless Europe, Woolley fulfilled his mission while covering his costs by transferring items from Iraq back to Britain, an entirely acceptable practice at the time. The loot he sent back to a grateful British museum kicked off an insatiable appetite for Mesopotamian antiquities in Europe. It's a fascination that was not going to end well for Iraq's ancient past. But Ur was just the tip of the iceberg. More than 12,000 sites have been identified, but only 10% of them have been studied. So you have references to these ancient cities, but no one really knew where they were. Uh, so people wanted to search for them. Uh, there was a, a long gap between when these cities were abandoned and knowledge about them uh, ceased effectively. The wealth of ancient treasures throughout Iraq was overwhelming and very, very seductive. And for the first half of the 20th century, it was a free-for-all. The trafficking of antiquities out of the Middle East is not a new phenomenon, and there have been attempts to uh, control this illicit trade on a, a international scale. The key issue with these policy attempts to prevent the trafficking of antiquities out of this region is that ancient borders are not modern borders. It's destined to be exploited by people who are looking for loopholes in the system. Ripped from the sand, these treasures were carted off to the world's capitals. It was wholesale plunder as the big museums picked and chose from Iraq's ancient relics. But there are relics, and then there are relics. If the 4,000-year-old city of Babylon had a crowning glory, the Ishtar Gate was it. Commissioned by King Nebuchadnezzar, it was constructed in 575 BCE and stood as one of eight gates into the ancient city. However, if you want to see it today, you'll need to go to the Pergamon Museum in Germany. The Ishtar Gate was one of the eight gates of Babylon, and uh, it was built by Nebuchadnezzar. It was excavated in the, the early 20th century, so they took all the bricks out, they packed them up, they were then taken away, smuggled out of the country. They only reconstructed the museum, the small one, because they didn't have room for the big one. The small one takes up you know, this huge, great space in the, um, in the museum. While Europe's museums were busy scooping up the riches of Mesopotamia, one person wanted Iraq to have a museum of its own. It's the 19th century, and a woman's place is supposed to be in the home, but a young Gertrude Bell defied convention. Having studied history at Oxford, she headed for the Middle East. She was the first woman to work for British military intelligence, joining Lawrence of Arabia as a champion of Arab nationalism in Cairo during the First World War. From that time on, Iraq became her obsession. She opened the Iraq National Museum of Baghdad in 1923 and became its first director. It grew into an institution worthy of Bell's legacy. By the time it was overrun by thieves in 2003, the Iraq Museum's 200,000 ancient treasures were housed in two massive public galleries. 
incredibly important place because it's sited in one of the most archaeologically rich countries in the, uh, in the ancient world. And uh, an enormous amount of work has been done there. The whole history of a very rich culture. But there was another thing Mesopotamia is said to have invented. And it was about to land Iraq and its museum in a heap of trouble. And that was war. For thousands of years, human beings have crossed swords over this land. And it's no different today. Because as it turns out, more than ancient treasures lie beneath its soil. Black gold. Oil. It drives nations to war and has torn the Middle East apart. Iraq's treasures would simply be collateral damage. In 1979, Saddam Hussein rode to power on a wave of bloody coups and assassinations. Like all dictators, he was not short on ambition. But ironically, for someone who believed he was making history, what he was really doing was laying the foundations for the destruction of his nation's cultural heart. Not that anyone was brave enough to question him on that. Saddam claimed to be the reincarnation of the biblical king Nebuchadnezzar, typically regarded as the empire's greatest king. His credits include the capture of Jerusalem in 597 BCE and sending the Jews into exile. Naturally, Saddam set himself up in a palace in Nebuchadnezzar's hometown, Babylon re-emulating Nebuchadnezzar and rebuilding Babylon, and he had his bricks with his name on it built into the re his reconstruction. Saddam believed that Iraq's history was his to do with as he pleased. One of his first meetings after his Ba'ath party came to power in 1968 was with a team of archaeologists to inform them of his plans. Saddam told the attentive gathering that he needed them to find him something big. Something dazzling to blind the world with Iraq's incredible wealth. It took until 1988 before Iraqi archaeologists working at the site of Nimrud finally delivered. The Nimrud treasure is the stuff of archaeological fantasies. The Nimrud treasure, uh, that is a treasure associated with uh, ancient queens of the Assyrian Empire. Uh, buried in the city of Nimrud. Uh, these were powerful queens um, who controlled actually a lot of the administration within the palace. And so it was undiscovered for, for, for really more than a century. Uh, the early excavators of Nimrud had missed uh, the treasures. So an extremely rare find, incredibly valuable. It's hard to say what price would fetch. There, there were tablets, inscriptions in these tombs that described not to obviously disturb the tombs. Complete with a colorful curse near the coffin of the queen of Assyria, is a warning to those who dare disturb her remains. The gods will make their lives a misery. People have associated with this curse because, of course, there were some things that did happen to some of the excavators afterwards. The Iraqi people never got to enjoy the treasure as it disappeared into the Iraq Museum. In 1991, Saddam bolted its doors shut, only to reopen them to the public just once, on his birthday in 2000. Now it was Saddam's personal playground. It was pretty much built as a, almost like a private collection. So if he, if he wanted to show off he, or he had an important visitor, they would get to see those objects. They would get to visit the museum. But everyday people um, almost never got to go into that museum. And the Iraqi people weren't too happy about it. The museum wasn't a symbol of national pride anymore. It was a place of shame, corrupted by a despised and ruthless regime. And the illicit antiquities industry took note. Some people say that uh, in areas where there is, that there's really no rule of law, that the antiquities, which belong to the local country, but they are world heritage, should be taken out and, um, and protected in, in another place. There are issues relating to that. Uh, you have to trust the other place. But like so many despots, 
Saddam's ambitions got the better of him. His invasion of Kuwait on the 2nd of August 1990 was to be his Waterloo moment. No one commits America's armed forces to a dangerous mission lightly, but after perhaps unparalleled international consultation and exhausting every alternative, it became necessary to take this action. Kuwait was liberated a month later. Tough sanctions were meant to punish Saddam, but it was the Iraqi people and their ancient riches that paid the price. Battling widespread poverty and malnutrition, Iraqis turned to the one thing they knew for certain would bring in money, looting. Apart from the obligatory TVs and microwaves, people also resorted to what was termed farming antiquities. Villagers formed covert teams and began to uncover and steal thousands of antiquities for illicit dealers who grew rich on the proceeds. Tragically, the supply chain they set up would soon lead to one of the greatest tragedies in the history of human culture. At the end of the first Gulf War, people lost their jobs, people's livelihoods were threatened, um, people were looking for ways of making money. You know, they needed to make ends meet. Um, and archaeological sites obviously offered one resource that could be exploited. Crooked international dealers and shady middlemen tapped into this crime wave, while hungry collectors waited in anticipation. There were laws that were supposed to stop this happening, but it felt like the world was just turning a blind eye to what was going on. I think we've realized retrospectively as material has surfaced on the market and it surfaced in collections, we realized it moved out of Iraq in the 1990s and it was moving out of Iraq in large quantities. So in the 90s, you see antiquities being included in the, the sanctions that were placed on Iraq, but the policy we have in place is only focused on Iraq. So if you're thinking like an antiquity smuggler, you're thinking about somebody wanting to create a false background for a piece, well, why don't you say it's from Jordan? Why don't you say it's from Lebanon? Or why don't you use the term Mesopotamia and imply that it's from everywhere and nowhere? You're kind of stuck when it comes to the policy that we have in place. One man was fighting an uphill battle to protect his country's heritage. Dr. Donnie George had been a member of staff at the Iraq Museum since 1976. He was part of the fabric of the place. He was absolutely dedicated to the history and the, um, and, and the culture of Iraq. He was truly dedicated. Uh, he was a very fine scholar. He was multilingual. It's not only our museum, you see, it's, it's the museum of the world. It's, it's the heritage of mankind that we have at this very important museum. But Donny George knew there was a storm on the horizon and there would be little he could do to stop it. On the 11th of September, 2001, Deputy DA Matthew Bogdanos watched in horror as the Twin Towers fell. A US Marine and a student of the classics, he always wanted to visit the cradle of civilization. He didn't know that one day he would be on the front line of an unfolding Middle Eastern tragedy. It was Osama bin Laden who ordered the attacks on America. President Bush went after Afghanistan and the Taliban first, but in March 2003, he cast the net wider. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. It was the turn of the millennium, and the Middle East was a tinderbox. The heart of this ancient civilization was set to explode. But for some, there was a potential upside to this saber rattling. Clearly, the, the smuggling networks that were set up then, um, the people involved, you know, they, they, were, they were clearly still active in the early 2000s, so the smuggling networks were there ready and waiting in 2003. It was just three months before the invasion 
and a group of collectors and dealers began circling. They knocked on doors and lobbied the Bush administration. Their mission was for the greater good, or so they claimed. US boots were not even on the ground, but they argued that a post-Saddam Iraq would benefit from relaxed antiquities trading laws and that these irreplaceable treasures would be safer outside Iraq. People have argued that um, there is the concept of, of global heritage and, uh, and that it doesn't necessarily belong to the nation state. But most widely, international laws and generally the, the public recognize that anything that is bought or, or excavated on the, in the soil of a particular country belongs to them. Uh, the idea that it's global heritage is, is very much, I think, a, a minority point of view and tends to be favoured by those who actually would like to acquire objects of some sort or another. While the trumpets of war played, Donny George was counting down to disaster. The Iraq Museum had been closed to the public for decades. If Baghdad was attacked, nobody was in any doubt that the museum would be a target. Around the world, Concerned academics and curators joined forces. They remembered what happened after the first Gulf War and didn't want to see it happen again. The Archaeological Institute of America warned the US military about the threat to the Iraq Museum. They thought they'd been heard, but they were wrong. I think people were aware that museums were vulnerable because, again, in the 1990s, several regional museums in Iraq um, had been looted. Two weeks before the fall of Baghdad, Lieutenant General Jay Garner sent all senior U.S. commanders a list of 16 high-priority institutions to be secured by U.S. troops. Near the top of that list, the Iraq Museum. But in times of war, one name on a list means very little. Dr. Donnie George and his colleagues accepted the reality. The US forces may not come to its rescue, so they did what they could to protect the collection. They hid some artifacts and wrapped foam padding around others that were too large to move. But inevitably, time ran out. As US troops moved in on Baghdad, Donny George set up camp in the museum with a handful of his colleagues. He slept there for two nights, though he probably spent little time actually sleeping. But as fierce fighting raged outside the museum walls, he was forced to abandon his post. The museum was left totally vulnerable. The US military were aware of this, but had other priorities. In 2003, Iraq was pumping out a quarter of the world's oil and controlled more than 60% of global oil reserves. The only facility defended by US troops when they entered Baghdad was site number 16 on General Garner's list, the oil ministry. As for the museum, Saddam's troops fortified it with trenches and put snipers on its upper story. US tanks returned fire, and when the Iraqi soldiers fled, the museum was left defenseless. April 2003, and Saddam's regime was collapsing. Jubilant Iraqis wasted no time in showing what they really thought of their beloved former leader. Thursday, the 10th of April, it would be 36 hours before US troops took Baghdad. For the doomed Iraq Museum, it was a window of destruction. They came with wheelbarrows, carts, bare hands, and took everything they could carry and destroyed the things they couldn't. In 36 hours, the priceless collection was gone or left as rubble. The human cost was palpable when the distraught museum staff members returned to a scene that defied belief. They had dedicated their lives to the protection 
of one of the world's greatest repositories of human history. In its place was nothing but despair. While those at the museum survived the disaster and struggled to comprehend what had happened, for the Iraqi people, it was a loss beyond measure. The Walker vase, gone. All that remained was its shattered base. And the Nimrod treasure, not a trace. It's a tragedy, a big, big tragedy for the uh, heritage of mankind. For Donny George, it was intensely personal. But he did the only thing he could. He took the news of this outrage to the world. The first day they went into Baghdad, they protected the Ministry of Oil. Journalists couldn't get enough, and it didn't take long to get his message out. While President Bush was bathing in the glory of victory, The news of the darker side of the victory left the world reeling. The big question, why didn't US troops step in to protect the museum despite all the warnings? In the early days of the Americans in Iraq, I think they just didn't prioritize protecting archeological sites. It was a very new concept to them. And since then, there's been a great deal of work by a lot of people to go into the military, to educate the military, but they, had, they really didn't understand. Excuses were given. Strategic and operational reasons were offered up by the military. But in the eyes of the world, the damage had been done. It was seen as a massive moral failure. Colonel Bogdanos arrived on the scene. He was there to lead an investigation into the sacking of the museum. Relying on his experience as a prosecutor, he also used his passion for history as his inspiration. To get to the bottom of what had happened, Bogdanus would need the help of a local. There would be only one man for the job, Donny George. The Plato-quoting Marine and the Iraqi historian were an odd couple, but they formed a tight alliance. Together, they faced their first challenge. There was something not right about how the museum was looted. Clues pointed to something sinister. It wasn't random. There was far more to this than just opportunistic looting while backs were turned. To begin with, no one could work out what exactly was missing. With empty display cabinets and shelves, there was no doubt that many thousands of relics had disappeared. But there was no way of knowing exactly what. There were no digital records. The Iraq Museum was old school in more ways than one. Any records that did exist were on paper, and the looters had destroyed most of them. Well, the, the people who were working there, they, they didn't have a, a full inventory. Uh, they would have been handwritten copies. A lot of that stuff would have been destroyed. As the international media turned its attention to the disaster of the museum, the media made wild accusations. And of course, the Iraqis, yes, um, for them, it's their heritage. And for them, I'm sure that they, they did definitely feel that it was being presented as, a, um, as something Western. It seems solving the mystery was going to be entirely up to our two detectives. They were on their own. For Bogdanos, this was personal. Across the Middle East, raids on smugglers' lairs were finding stolen antiquities in the hands of the very same people handling the trade in weapons, drugs, and humans. Bogdanos was a sworn defender of history, but he also knew the money made by selling the stolen antiquities would be used to kill American soldiers. In some ways, this became more than an investigation into organized looting, but also terrorism and murder. It was a symbiotic relationship, and one that was repeated in conflict zones across the globe. You're operating in a, in a black market system. Black market is hazardous. You're operating in a system where there is a, in, in countries where there is no rule of law. Collectors don't care about 
anything to do with either the provenance or the uh, the passage, the, the means, the passage and the means of uh, of transport to the place where they acquire these things. They really don't care because they know that they are operating outside the law. It's not important to them. The profits from these go to fund more guns. People get robbed, they get killed. There's blood on the trail all the way down the line till it ends up in wherever it ends up in some little shiny closet with a light on. George and Bogdanos were faced with two jobs, retrieving as many items as possible and figuring out what on earth had happened. So what did the scene of the crime reveal? The destruction in the main galleries was easy to see. Of the 451 display cases, 450 had been cleaned out. But downstairs, the scene was far more sinister. A basement storage area guarded by padlocked doors had been breached through a hidden access point and locked cabinets had been opened not by force, but with keys. The area was a mess. Some of the museum's most precious artifacts had been taken off display and conveniently placed in a room with outside access. This meant one thing, inside knowledge. Did they know what they were doing? Uh, you have multiple dynamics at play. In the public galleries, the evidence very clearly suggests that the individuals were selective and knew precisely what to take. This is not to suggest that random people didn't go in there as well, but they took one item and not the one next to it. They were quite selective, and they chose the highest value items that were on the gallery floor. Well, this means they knew what they wanted, and uh, they must have been uh, specialists Having forensically assessed the crime scene, as well as taking in the bigger picture, Donny George and Matthew Bogdanos had all the facts they needed. And they thought they'd figured it out. It was the work of three groups. One, the opportunists. They took what they could carry and vented their fury on the things they couldn't. With no idea what they were destroying, they didn't hold back. Two, the insiders. Missing jewelry and thousands of cylinder seals had disappeared from the locked basement. Only those with inside knowledge and access could get to these. And three, the professionals. Those who targeted the most valuable items were clearly under instruction. They had looted to order, perhaps for murky middlemen linked to private collectors with tentacles deep in the illicit trade. The hunt for the looters was on but three different modes of operation call for different tactics. Bogdanos and George knew that the opportunists who stole on the spur of the moment would have no idea how to unload them. Red alerts would be all over the marketplace to watch out for anything suspect, so Bogdanos had an idea. Marines on active duty had access to what's called an amnesty box. Any soldier who picked something up in the field that they shouldn't could put it in the box, no questions asked. Using a similar idea paid off. With an unprecedented flood of material hitting the market, prices plummeted and with nowhere to sell their prizes, looters took up the offer. As it was more difficult to sell the loot, the trickle of returned objects became a flood. So much so, people resorted to stopping US soldiers in the street to hand over stolen treasures. And loose-lipped informers led investigators to some of the most precious objects. Incredibly, the vase of Walker was turned in, and not a moment too soon. The, uh, the Walker vase went missing in April, and it was returned in June uh, under an, an amnesty. Now, why it was given back, so they may have given it back just to protect themselves, or it's possible that they may have given it back um, out of a sense of, uh, of, of national pride in the end. But there was still a massive hole in the inventory. The great Nimrod treasure was still missing. But strangely, it was not listed in any of the museum's catalogues. It was as if it had never been there in the first place. But soon people began to talk. It seemed the treasure was last seen in the possession of Saddam Hussein's youngest son, Kusei. Right to the end, the Hussein family saw the treasures of Iraq as their personal playthings. But a determined search turned up information that gave museum staff hope. The trail ended at a flooded bank vault in Baghdad. 
The Nimrud treasures were uh, effectively hidden in the bank vaults after the 1991 uh, conflict. So uh, extremely precious items were hidden in the bank vault, which was considered the most, among the most secure places uh, in the Iraqi state prior to the wars. The U.S. did bomb the bank because it had a, a radio tower, it led to the flooding of the bank um, because, of course, uh, the bank was sitting next to the Tigris River and the, the pumps no longer worked, the power was out, um, and eventually the bank uh, vaults flooded, but the treasures were effectively intact. Queen Yabo's tiara was back in safe hands. Yet her curse was about to claim some high-value victims. Kusei Hussein was shot by US forces on the 22nd of July, 2003. And Saddam Hussein was captured on the 13th of December, 2003, tried and found guilty of crimes against humanity. On the 30th of December, 2006, he made the long walk to the gallows. As insiders and opportunists continued returning their loot, Bogdanos and George knew the professionals were another story. If someone, somewhere, was willing to pay big money to get their hands on specific items from the Iraq Museum, they were not about to drop them off in an amnesty box. Most of these pieces would be long gone, and most likely across international borders. For those trying to disrupt the trade in illicit antiquities, things got hazardous once loot disappeared into what's called the grey market. That's the murky netherworld between the black market and legitimate trade. But in this world, nothing is black and white. We tend to characterize the antiquities market as a gray market. And this is because most antiquities that come for sale don't have a um, public ownership history. Collectors of high-end antiquities know where antiquities come from. They know about looting. They know about trafficking. These are, these are very public crimes. The issue is that they don't necessarily see their collecting behavior as linked to these crimes. Most collectors are looking for clean, 100% legal antiquities. Otherwise, to avoid trouble, next best is ambiguity. The murkier the history of their looted artifacts, the easier they'll sleep at night. And it's in these murky waters that the grey market thrives. People talk about the black market and we say, well, you know, where is the black market? We can't see it. All we can see are dealers, auction houses, museums all around the world who are acquiring both licit and illicit material. We can't really distinguish between the black and the white. Authorities across the world do what they can to stem the tide. But unfortunately, even investigating, let alone prosecuting those at the market end of the antiquities chain, is next to impossible. Despite the role they play in creating demand for looted items in the first place. Criminological research has shown that white-collar criminals are simply harder to detect than uh, more traditional criminals who are uh, robbing a house or, or stealing a car. These black market dealers and collectors have the benefit of resources and gold-plated legal advice that bottom-of-the-chain petty thieves do not. As a result, risk versus reward ends up in the criminal's favor, and antiquities continue to slip through the net. Knowing that London is a primary market for antiquities in general, we decided with some reporters to go uh, and look at some places. It was easier to, to sort of just get in there as a, as a normal person and just have a look, effectively. And I would focus on objects that derive from periods where we can tell where the, the, the objects likely came from, some very relatively early periods. And we were able to find uh, a few things, certainly. And so that made it clear to us that, that some objects were very much likely coming in. We don't know when they came in exactly, but it does indicate that objects not only are of interest in this region, but they were also coming in. Looting only exists because there are people who buy antiquities and choose not to ask the right questions. Merely identifying the thieves won't fix the problem. It's unrelenting demand that drives the market 
And unfortunately, wealthy collectors and shady dealers will almost always get what they want. Ugly morals, beautiful results. Many collectors are attracted to the, the physical quality of these pieces, these, these antiquities as artworks, as representations of beauty. And if you think about it, who wouldn't want beauty in your home? Collectors that are attracted to the beauty and form of these pieces often develop this interest early in their life through interacting with museums, through studying art history, um, through, again, real and legitimate engagements with the past. Back in Baghdad, museum staff worked around the clock to put things right. It was now February 2015. The Iraq Museum wants a private plaything of a tyrant, then a place of empty shelves and rubble, finally reopened to the world. And one of the main attractions, Queen Yabo's tiara and the treasures of Nimrud were on display for the first time since 1991. But it's hard to make the case that this story has a happy ending. Dr. Donnie George was appointed proud director of the restored Iraq Museum. But in 2006, an envelope arrived in the mail containing a bullet and threats to his family. He fled Iraq and sought refuge in the United States. At the age of 60, he died following a heart attack, half a world away from the land he loved. Though his crime-fighting partner was gone, Matthew Bogdanos continued the struggle against looting in civilian life. At his request, Manhattan's district attorney set up an antiquities trafficking unit that he now heads up. It's been the driving force behind countless seizures of illicit antiquities in the US. Almost 20 years after the museum was ransacked, about 7,000 of the 15,000 objects stolen have been returned to the museum. Many of those were recovered outside Iraq's borders, but the rest have vanished. They didn't have a very detailed record, particularly the smaller pieces, and uh, they, uh, then a lot of those records were lost. We really don't know how much has not come back uh, of the big pieces, the, pe the most important pieces. Um, of course, there is, there is memory of those. The tragedy of the Iraq Museum is just one chapter in the long and sorry tale of Iraq's cultural desecration. Outside Baghdad, the lawlessness that descended on Iraq after the war was the green light for looters to do their worst. It was nothing short of a rampage. And they focused their efforts on the richest sites. Some estimate that as many as 600,000 antiquities were plundered between 2003 and 2005. That's 40 times more than disappeared from the Iraq Museum. Nobody will ever know what's been lost. There's no winding back the clock. The thread that joins the present to the past is as delicate as a spider's web. Once it's broken, it's gone forever. As is the chance to learn more about ourselves. The people who steal the past are also robbing the future. Because when we are gone, all that remains are the things we have made and the stories we have told.